Welcome to Lemonade Maker Part 5. Thank you for welcoming us into your home and life this week. We're coming to you from Spanaway Lake today to remind you, hey, that although it may feel like everything is canceled, God's creation isn't canceled, hope isn't canceled, the gospel of Jesus isn't canceled, the favor, blessing, and presence of God in your life isn't canceled. And just this week I heard that fishing is no longer canceled. I think I just heard a shout of praise from the Randalls and Barnards place somewhere in that direction. <laughs> Apparently, the government's no longer concerned if fish get infected or something. I know, whoa, I know we're getting a little salty right, right out of the gates here. It's all good. Today we're gonna come around a question that is on everyone's mind, and that is, when are the Johnsons gonna have us over for a barbecue? Am I right? Am I right? So put your food requests in the chat right now. Maybe a close second would be the question of when is this all going to end, right? We're getting tired and worn down by it all. You know, when difficulties go on and on and on, I think it's just human nature to consider giving up and giving in and quitting whatever limited God has called you to make during this time. The whole premise of this series is that God hasn't called you to play even more video games or watch even more shows, but to actually redeem this turbulent time and build something, do something, learn something, dream something, or become something that God has called you to become. In other words, take what the enemy meant for evil, a pandemic full of suffering, chaos, hardships, and losses, and turn it into something good. Now today's message is about fatigue and not giving up. Nehemiah and his crew have been making lemonade out of a bad situation. About the same amount of time that we've been in quarantine. They have been rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem so they can have protection from their enemies. Now there's a reason the project hasn't made any, you know, much progress for over 100 years. The obstacles were huge. The enemy was committed to stopping them. And they've been at it for over a month. Progress is being made and the enemy's attempts to stop them have been thwarted. But the enemy's stubborn. The obstacles are stubborn. The odds stacked against you maybe right now are stubborn. So here's the thing. If the enemy can't take you out, then he knows the next best thing is to wear you down. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. There should be some amens in the chat if you showed up for church today right now. So this is what happens. The enemy, like a battering ram, keeps at it. Bam, discouragement. Bam, setback. Bam, fight with someone. Bam, fear. Bam, no stimulus check. So things keep happening and coming against the lemonade that Nehemiah is trying to make, but he calls them out. Look at Nehemiah 6.9. It says, they were trying to intimidate us into quitting. They thought they'll give up, they'll never finish it. The same thing could be said for you and I. Whatever they or it is, talking trash, trying, trying to intimidate you, trying to get you to quit making progress, but you're a man or a woman of God and you know our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. So we pick up our shield of faith and we extinguish those flaming arrows from the evil one. And then we pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and we fight back with another famous 6-9 in the Bible. Galatians 6-9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now notice that it doesn't say may reap or might reap, but will reap a harvest. But we have to hang in there, guys, and outlast the enemy. Which brings us to our theme for today. Some battles are won by defeating the opposition, but some battles are won by outlasting them. You know, David in the Bible is a case study of this. He was anointed the next king as a teenager, which was awkward since there already was a king and then had an early victory against Goliath the giant that instantly made him a national hero. He still wasn't king yet, but he went and humbly served the current king, King Saul. Saul, unfortunately, had a major insecurity issue and, and tried to kill David over and over to the point where David is living on the run. All he did was the right thing for King Saul, and all he got back was opposition. This didn't go on for a day or a month or even a year. This went on, guys, for 13 years. And during that time, he had several opportunities to take Saul out. David wasn't about to touch God's anointed. He trusted God with the timing of it all until Saul ultimately died in battle. See, David won this battle, not by defeating the opposition, but by outlasting him. This is so important for you and I to get nailed down. Sometimes we pray and fast and have faith for certain things and God allows us to experience a relatively quick victory. Those are Goliath moments. 
They're amazing moments, and God is so good to give them to us. But they're often the exception, not the rule. Because at other times, we do the same thing. Come on. You know it's true. We pray, and we fast, and we believe for it. And it just doesn't seem like anything is happening. We get worn down. And we're tempted to give up because we think the battle must have been lost or there is no harvest to be reaped. But the battle hasn't been lost. It's not a Goliath battle that we're in, but a Saul kind of battle. And we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We have to outlast the opposition. We have to outlast the discouragement, outlast the financial crisis, outlast that relationship blow up, outlast the fatigue of these weird times. So for the next few moments, Nehemiah is going to show us how to outlast the opposition. So let's read chapter 6, 1-4 through four together. It says, When word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I, I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should, I, why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same reply. See, Nehemiah is getting closer, right, to completing his goal. But the enemy isn't finished. Four times his cell phone goes off in a worship service. See, the devil is into distraction. He will do whatever he can to divert your attention away from the lemonade you've been called to make. It may be too much social. It may be unnecessary Zoom meetings. It may be a lack of boundaries on your part or less important priorities. On Easter, I shared about renting a cabin cruiser and sailing around the Puget Sound. It didn't have a lifeboat, but a life raft. We just assumed it was good to go until we tried to use it one time to explore an island. What was supposed to be our salvation in a time of crisis, we discovered was full of holes. See, one benefit of the time that we are in is that so many things have been stopped and been canceled that it gives us an opportunity to consider the life rafts that have been our salvation in the past and see if they are full of holes. Maybe all the stuff we used to be busy with was just propping up our ego or gave us an excuse not to be present in hard relationships or deal with the hurts or habits inside of us. They may have seemed like a, a life rat, but were actually a distraction because the enemy, like it said in Nehemiah 6, was scheming to harm you, harm me. But you can outlast the opposition when you commit yourself to a great work. That was Nehemiah's response to this distraction. He sees it for what it is, and he says, oh no, to oh no, four times, right? Now you can put oh no to dad jokes in, 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 a, in the chat for all I care. It was just too good to pass up. So Nehemiah wasn't giving himself to superficial and superfluous things. He was investing his life into things that mattered. I'm wondering, what about you? Maybe the reason you feel like a ship tossed by the waves is you don't have a great work a great project, something worthy of the precious time, talent, and treasure that God has entrusted to you. Maybe it's time to commit yourself to a great work. See, God hasn't left you here just to binge on electronics, but to invest into people and projects that matter. In the early days of mission work in India, a young, highly capable man arrived there to advance the gospel. His talent was obvious and his impact was immediate. Not only did he catch the attention of the people he was ministering to, but he also caught the attention of a multinational company. They offered him a prestigious position with the company, making lots of money. But the young missionary turned them down. But not to be dissuaded, they made several more offers, increasing the pay and benefits each time. Finally, the young man sent them a letter, thanking them for the offer, but he wasn't, uh, but he wasn't declining it because the pay was too low. He was declining it because the job was too small. See, what, what has God called you to advance during this time? But this isn't an exhibition fight that you're in. This, this fight is scheduled to go as many rounds as it takes. Same with Nehemiah. So the opponent comes out of his corner with another strategy, an open letter accusing Nehemiah of planning a revolt against the king of Babylon. And to appoint himself the new king of Jerusalem. 
Nehemiah's response is classic. I love it. I, I don't know if your high school did this, but we would get into spirit battles at football games. Right? You, you remember the drill? We've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? And then the other fans would chant it back, right? And eventually we would shorten it to, we've got more. And the other team would chant that back. Finally, our cheerleaders came up with a genius response. They just took their hand and they went, ha! Huh! And that was the end of it. That was the end of it. And so Nehemiah gives them a ha huh! response in verse 8. It says, you're just making it all up. But what he does next at the end of verse 9 is another way we can outlast the opposition. It says, but I prayed, now strengthen my hands. I don't know if you've noticed, but Nehemiah doesn't pray to check it off his list. He prays to survive, man. And sometimes we think that God is committed to our comfort and the devil is committed to giving us crummy circumstances. But sometimes it is the devil who gives us comfort to the point where we forget that we need God and God will allow crummy circumstances so we fall to our knees and ask for strength that will enable us to arise. These are, man, there are times, man, when you and I need a fight, we need a battle, we need a hard place to remind me where my help comes from. You can put that in the chat. I need a fight. See, because you know what? I've got a friend in Jesus. He is where my help comes from. It doesn't come from the right or from the left. It doesn't come from Washington, D.C. It doesn't come from the economy. It doesn't come from a stimulus check, which I haven't received yet. Do, do I sound a little bitter? <laughs> Nehemiah shows us that we can outlast the opposition when we lean on the Lord for strength. Some of you may remember the old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. The last verse reads, What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have peace complete with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Then it gets to the chorus, which we used to have a lot of fun with when it says leaning, by, by leaning hard on someone next to you, right? Come on, this, this is your opportunity wherever you are right now. Uh, when it gets to the chorus, it goes leaning, you can lean on someone leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Here we go, leaning, leaning, and then we would hold it for emphasis, you can, you can hold it for emphasis, leaning on the everlasting arms. You know, the Lord longs to give you strength, to outlast the opposition, if you and I will only ask the Lord promises in Isaiah 40, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Which brings us to round three of this heavyweight fight. Let's read chapter 6, 10 through 13. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, who was shut in at his house. He said, let us meet in the house of God, inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night, they're coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Apparently Shemaiah was a friend of Nehemiah's and Nehemiah took time away from the work on the wall to go check on his buddy who was shut up in his home. There certainly isn't any application for us there, right? Shut-ins, you know, used to be a small category of people but now it's just about the only category. Remember way back when the church wasn't over until you chatted it up with a few friends after the service? Why not get on your phone and do that today when this is over? You certainly can think of someone that could use a call, all right? So this was a low blow because now the enemy is using his friend to try and bring him down. He pretends to be concerned for Nehemiah's life and suggests that he do something against the Old Testament law. See, only priests were allowed into certain parts of the temple regardless of the circumstances. Fortunately, Nehemiah sees through his friend's advice and quickly discerns that he'd been paid off to try and discredit his reputation. Have you ever noticed that everyone who claims to speak for God really isn't? It doesn't matter if they are a friend or a relative, you need to go to the Word of God and check it out for yourself. 
One thing God never does is contradict himself. But the part I really want us to see is how this incident helped Nehemiah outlast the opposition yet again. He wasn't just thinking about himself. So we need to realize it's not all about you. See, Nehemiah was motiva- motivated by how his choices would affect others. He knew that running away from his enemies and hiding would communicate fear instead of courage. The last thing that his fatigued crew needed was a leader who was putting out fearful, nervous vibes. So what does this have to do with you and I? Well, what kind of vibes are you putting out right now? Anybody you have influence with can smell when you are nervous and fearful. Are you and I communicating fear or courage to our families, our friends, our coworkers, or employees? You may not see it yourself as a leader like Nehemiah, but you and I have a responsibility to model courage for those who look to us. Philippians 2 says each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Leverage your concern for others to do what's right and go another round to outlast the enemy. I can't tell you how many times I have made a choice that my flesh didn't want to make for the benefit of my family, for the benefit of those who don't know Christ, and even for your benefit. Do you remember when someone you admired didn't outlast the enemy? It did something stupid. Do you remember the pain and disappointment that it caused others? Maybe right now you aren't super motivated to make lemonade or outlast the enemy for yourself. Then do it for others. They need your example. They need your courage. Do it for them. Do it for them. Finally, determine to be more stubborn than the opposition. One of the most famous boxing matches took place in 1974 between George Foreman and Muhammad Ali. The rumble in the jungle, you may remember it. Ali went on to win the fight by using a technique called rope a The strategy is to let your opponent wear themselves out by throwing lots and lots and lots of non-injuring punches. You and I, we can't control what the enemy throws at us, but the goal isn't to win rounds one, two, or three, but to outlast the opposition and win the fight, which is exactly what Nehemiah did. Look at 6.15 and 16. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elu in 52 days. When our, all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. That's amazing. This was an incredible accomplishment to pull off in such a short time. They rebuilt a city wall and all of its gates in only 52 days. Nehemiah stubbornly made lemonade and because he didn't give up, he was able to reap the harvest promised to those who are committed to doing what God calls them to do. But you and I have to outlast the opposition. You know, I've been at this a while and I've had to learn to outlast many things. I've had to outlast my own insecure thoughts, which told me I couldn't do it. I'm not qualified. I don't have the talent. And like Moses, I can't speak well. I've had to outlast slander and lies. I've had to outlast attempts to bring division. I've had to outlast seasons of profound discouragement. I've had to outlast times of loneliness. I've had to outlast famines of all kinds. And the list goes on. I couldn't pray them away or believe them away because I tried. But I could stubbornly hold on to the hand of my Jesus and keep showing up to my post, which is what I've done. You know, right now, the opposition may be throwing all kinds of things at you. You're taking punches to your mind. You're taking punches to your heart. You're taking punches to your wallet, punches to your dreams. And he's got you on the ropes. The same thing was happening to Nehemiah days before the wall was finished. But the only way to reap a harvest is to not give up. What would have happened if Nehemiah had given up at day 49? We've got to outlast our opponent. Let him throw a hook, but no weapon formed against us will prosper. Let him throw a jab, you know, but my God, we'll we'll work all things together for good. Let, Let him throw that knockout punch. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You know what, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've got staying power. The God in your corner is called the everlasting God. You come to this fight wearing the robe of his everlasting covenant of love. He has filled you with his everlasting life, is leading you in the everlasting way to build an everlasting kingdom and receive an everlasting reward. Because of the resurrection power of Jesus, you have what it takes to outlast the enemy. In Hawaii, the cockroaches grow huge and some of them 
need saddles. I know. Hey, bugs and saddles in the chat. You know, our, our feet is going to need an exterminator, I'm sure. And some cockroaches don't just crawl, but they fly. You, you better duck when they take flight. I'm told they've been around since prehistoric times, relatively unchanged. Man, you can put out traps and bug bombs and on and on, but they will still come back. One time I got in a war with one of the, the big flying ones and it was on the ground so I stepped on it and I heard it crunch under my feet. I then moved my shoe but it kept walking. So I stepped on it again, even harder, and slowed it down but it kept moving. Finally I stepped on it so hard that it got squished out. But you may have guessed it already, it wasn't moving very fast but it kept on moving. Man, that cockroach may have been squished, but it hadn't surrendered. But I'm wondering about you today. Maybe you've been stepped on hard during this pandemic. Maybe your life raft has been exposed as being full of holes. Maybe the plans you had, the lemonade you intended to make, felt like they've been squished. But have you surrendered? You know, if a cockroach can get back up and keep making progress, how much more can God's kids outlast whatever is thrown at them in Jesus' name? If you believe it and receive it, say amen. Let's pray together. Lord, I just want to thank you for everyone who is here right now. And God, and there may be some who want to give their life to you, who begin to put their faith in you and follow Jesus for the first time in their life. If that's you, you can ask Jesus into your life and in your heart right now. Lord Jesus, I need you. You can just repeat this prayer with me wherever you are. I need you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Lord, I want to follow you from this day forward. Lord, help all of us outlast the opposition in our life. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you said yes to Jesus today, to put your faith in him, to follow him, hey, we'd be so honored if you would text decision FCC all one word to 84576 and we'd love to send some material to you uh, free of charge to help you get started in your new journey with Jesus. Hey thanks for joining us today. God bless you.